Hey there, it's Mandy Montana. Are you taking great care of your skin? You know I use great products. I take my vitamins and I drink plenty of water, but I could be better about applying sunscreen daily and making sure my skin is protected against premature aging. What about you? Well, I've got great news. I have a solution. It's the new Premium Diamond Glow Treatment at Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler. I love it. I went recently and it exfoliates and hydrates your skin at the same time. Amazing, right? My skin feels so soft and silky after. You have to try it. If you've never had a facial before, they have different options at Hand in Stone, like hydrating and brightening. But if you're struggling with dark spots, hyperpigmentation, sun damage, sallow skin, enlarged pores, or maybe oily skin, this is the treatment for you. If you want your skin to glow and look and feel amazing, book the Diamond Glow. Schedule now by visiting Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in the Cumberland Shopping Center in Tyler or online at handandstonetyler.com. Welcome to the Celebrating Women podcast, hosted by Mandy Montana a podcast that celebrates women, their stories, their struggles, and ability to overcome. Conversations that celebrate their gifts, their talents, and courage. It's the Celebrating Women podcast. Presented by Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler, Texas. With over 20 massage therapists and six estheticians certified and trained in multiple protocols, you can get an affordable massage or facial located right here in the East Texas area. Book your appointment today. Stop by the spa in the Cumberland Shopping Center in Tyler or online at handandstonetyler.com. Welcome back to the Celebrating Women podcast. I'm Mandy Montana with a special guest today, my friend, Stephanie Taylor. Glad to be here. I've wanted you to be on the show for probably as long as it started. You were like on my initial, I had a list of women that I wanted to talk to and you were on it. Oh, that's so awesome. Yes. And we've sat here and talked for a solid 30 minutes about other things. Yes. <laughs> so you and I can talk all day. We, we really could. <laughs> we need more coffee and more water, but we could do it. I know it. I know it. <laughs> So I just wanted to talk today about what what did you want to be when you grow up? I love this topic <laughs> because it changes, right? Like well, and everyone asks yeah. your whole life. Yes. From the time that you can talk and mm -hmm. interact and have a conversation, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you get, of course, answers like a pro wrestler or <laughs> that's a good one that is a great one a ballerina or you know mine if you had to ask me when i was eight mm -hmm. i would have said an olympic gymnast oh right? really but every eight-year-old girl's yeah. dream did you love mary lee retton too i did me too i, did. I had the leotard and the whole nine the whole yards. Thing. Yeah. She came to Tyler. She we met did? her. I've met her several <gasps> times. Oh, I got I, chills. That's so cool. I know. I was a competitive gymnast growing up here. Uh -huh. And yeah, she came. And then we went down to Houston all the time. We spent mm -hmm. our summers down at the training center. And so she was there. And it was just really fun and neat. So that's what I wanted to be when I was eight. When you were eight? <laughs> ten. Did eight it, to ten. Did it evolve? It did. So, well, a little bit, you know, with gymnastics, it's a really a mm -hmm. lifelong commitment over your childhood, the life of your childhood. Yes, and, it is. And so I always wanted to be a, a gymnast, but then I wanted to be a doctor. Okay. That was my big. And you're not a doctor. I am not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and I think about, I'm like, would I, if, if, and I would not go to medical school, but at, you know, in your 40s, what can I picture myself being a doctor mm -hmm. and going to clinic every day? And I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon so oh. I can fix my bad well, gymnastic sneeze. <laughs> yeah, that totally makes sense. <laughs> Repair myself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it, it did evolve. And I think it's still evolving. You know, I've I feel like that you don't necessarily have to define exactly what you're going to be when you grow up. But I have four kids. Mm -hmm. And so currently we are, you know, working through that process of college and how to decide that. And all of our friends' kids are graduating and they're like, I have no idea what I want to do. And so I don't have any idea what I want to <laughs> do when I grow up. So how do you guide 
young children and then into semi adults, Mm -hmm. you know, how do you guide them to know what they want to be when they grow up to declare a major? So yesterday I sat with uh, my son, he's 21, with his college advisor Mm -hmm. and You know, he didn't do so hot in one of his classes in his major (laughs) this semester. Mm -hmm. And so then he's like, then then come the the self-doubt and the, you know, maybe this is not what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should try something different. And but then I just want to get to graduation and I just you know, want to be in the world and start working and being a surviving adult. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's his dream. That's his dream is to have an office job and do what he wants to do with Mm -hmm. the money that he makes from his hard work. I don't think he cares what it is. He doesn't have like a driving purpose and passion. Some people do at that age. Some people, a lot of people don't though. A, a more, I think more people don't than they do. I agree. And so, yeah, he doesn't, he just wants to work. And he, even since he was a kid, he just wanted to be an adult. He's kind of the old soul. Mm-hmm. Like he likes adults better than he likes his peers. Mm-hmm. And so he's just ready to be in the workforce. And so how do you, you know, guide that? And so he's like, well, if I switch my major, then, you know, I then I feel like I don't really have that clear vision and plan. And, and then we have our older son. He has worked for a chicken restaurant that everybody loves for ever probably three years Mm -hmm. and he said if I just fry chicken for the rest of my life that needs to be okay (laughs) my husband and I are like you know what that is okay as long as you're happy and you're fulfilled it maybe we shouldn't let our careers and and what we do as a job define us so much instead of us defining ourselves as individuals and I think you nailed it I think you nailed it with that. Our identity, oftentimes, I think, in our culture gets wrapped up in what we do instead of who we are. It does. I know mine has. And mine's been intricately intertwined since I was 18 and became Mandy Montana because Mm -hmm. this was like this other persona that I had to be on the air that's it's me. It's a part of me, but it's like a it's like an elevated part of me. Right. It's the positive parts of me. It's it's the side that I want the public to see. I have other sides that are vulnerable and sad and deal with, you know, struggling challenges and things. But like I get to hide that part away in my private life, mm-hmm. whereas like Mandy Montana is this like sparkling version of my idealized self. Right. And so when I left radio, I really struggled with. Who am I? That because that was your identity. My identity for was your job. Eight to twelve hours a day, six or seven days a week, was that. And so I had to be on Mm -hmm. all the time. All the time. All the time. Unless I was like at home in a quiet little corner by myself, right? And so it's it's interesting because I think that when we ask that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? It places and it 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 categorizes and identifies a child or a person or a young adult. And I started this at 18. So I found it early. I was one of those rare people who found what they wanted to do in life at a very early age. So when people ask you what you wanted Mm -hmm. to be when you grow up, what did you say? Well, it changed a lot when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. So a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But I was watching my parents go through divorce and that looked like Um. it was... Yeah. In some ways, it looked like I was like, oh, I could argue. And then other ways I was like, oh, but I don't want to argue over like people's hearts. Right. Right. So I I didn't have the capacity to understand at that age that there are lots of different types of law. You know, I was only seeing family law. Then I wanted to be a psychologist, again, wanting to repair like myself, kind of like you were saying with an orthopedic surgeon. Right. Like I was dealing with a lot of trauma. So I wanted to learn how to repair myself as a psychologist. And then I just really had such great teachers in high school that there was a, a part of me that wanted to give the gift of mentorship and care and guidance that my teachers were giving me. I wanted to be able to give that to other people. So radio just took me way by surprise. I loved it. I loved listening. I was a avid listener, recorded 
my favorite DJs on the air and my favorite music. It never, and I was using skills, like I was making mixtapes and mm-hmm. things like that, but I never realized that could, that that could be my profession. I just, it felt like something over here that was really cool that other people did. Yeah. And then whenever it became an opportunity for me, I was like, oh, maybe I can do this. Maybe I do have these skills. So what was that pivotal moment for you? (laughs) As a career or when I first got introduced to it? Uh, When you first got introduced to it. I got asked, I I was a very good student and I was... One of those kids who said the right things, did the right things, student government, all mm-hmm. that. I was in a program called D.A.R.E. that you might remember, Drug Abuse Resistance Education. I think that used to be Defiant in my day. Okay. Because I'm a little bit older that, than that. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I don't know if it still exists because I think what it ended up doing was showing all the interesting things that drugs do for you to children and they got curious. Right. But at the time it was meant to prevent kids trying drugs. And so I was a D.A.R.E. role model. I went to the radio station to cut a public service announcement about the D.A.R.E. program and got curious. And the reason I got invited to do that was because my mom worked with another lady whose best friend was a DJ. And they would talk at work about me and how, like, that I was smart and that I was interested in music and all this stuff. And they were like, what, how could we get her in there? How could we how could we introduce this to her since this is something that she's interested in? And so they leveraged me being a role model into that. And then I just, I got curious and started talking into the microphone, talking with people that worked there. And there was a job opportunity to insert commercials into college football games. I had to listen for a cue and press a button on time. I mean, these are pretty basic skills. I was a smart kid, but I could do that <laughs> and, and show up on time and be responsible. So that was my first job was, I think the first football game I ran was a Baylor game, actually. Oh, I know. Right. And so I was just, I would listen for the, you know, Baylor football will be back in one minute or whatever the cue was. Yeah. And I would hit the commercial and then sit and listen to the game the rest of the time. So that's so funny that you said that because I was thinking if I could like have any job So now, just thinking Mm -hmm. about myself now, and if I could rewind, I would love to be a sportscaster for college football Uh, because I have an opinion. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Yeah. So we talk about that all the time. So when we're watching college football, and of course, I'm a Baylor Bear, so, and I stick with them through thick and so... My husband and I, he's like, can you pipe down? I'm trying to watch the game. And I'm like, I should totally commentate this game. (laughs) Well, do you know the Smokes? David Smoke? You know, that's where he is Uh now and what he's doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's so awesome. I love that. But that would be my like fun, like all time fun job is being on the football field. That's what my dad wanted me to do. He wanted me to either be a sideline reporter for sports or a weather personality. Like a meteorologist, which that I have a friend who similar situation to your son studied meteorology, thought that's what he wanted to do, failed the first big test and then had to have a hard conversation with the instructor. And he was like, I think you need to go a different path. Hey guys, it's Mandy. You know I love Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler, and one of the things I love the most is they're always doing new things. And I recently tried their new sports massage, and I've got to tell you, it's in incredible. So you know I'm active and I'm always focused on wellness. And this is just one more thing that I am adding in to my routine because now I'm hooked. They use the Theragun, which of course is going to help increase blood flow to certain areas and muscles that might be sore or tired or need attention. But you also get to add on another upgrade. You know, whenever I was there, I chose to go ahead and do the cup gliding as well as the hot stones. They work really well with the Theragun, maybe like a triple threat. Definitely ask for it the next time you go in to Hand in Stone. Ask about the sports massage. You can book your appointment today online at handinstonetyler.com or you can stop by and see them. They're located in South Tyler in the Cumberland Shopping Center. Uh, oh, well, and for kids to, to have to change that path, mm-hmm. you know, college is so expensive right now and <laughs> to tack Beyond on expensive. extra semesters 
Yeah. When all you want to do is be a hard worker in an office is is tough because I think it's going for for people who don't know what they want to be. I mm-hmm. think that evolves over time. And you're right. Like some people, they just know it and they're amazing at it and they have that that strength and and it that is amazing to me. My dad worked for the same company for 45 years and then retired. And that's always what he did. And he seemed to like it. <laughs> I think that's generational, though. It, I think we're seeing a big shift there because yeah. would you is your dad a boomer? Yeah, I mm-hmm. think I think that's what they were sort of taught to do. Absolutely. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. to the company and that the company would be loyal to to mm-hmm. them. And I think we've seen a big shift over the last 20 years that companies are not as loyal to their employees right. as they once were. I mean, there's no longer pension plans at most right. places. You've got to have an independent retirement plan. And so why why would we be so loyal to a corporation that's not loyal to us? I think is the question yeah. that a lot of people have yeah. asked. Well, and just really asking yourself what your skill sets are as mm-hmm. well, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, maybe you you get this job and then I you know, I'm a real proponent of being a lifelong learner. And I feel like with jobs, you can if you show up and you work hard and you're dependable and you're on time, you could pretty much do anything. If you show up and you're dependable and people can trust you, that's the core that everyone should show up to work with, no matter what you do. And so then what you do could change and evolve Mm -hmm. as long as you have that foundational piece. And with guiding my kids through this now, so my daughter, her whole life wanted to be a teacher Mm -hmm. and she's very nurturing and she would be an amazing teacher. Like I could see it. First semester in college, she sat in to observe a classroom and she came home first day and she's like, I don't want to be a teacher anymore. And we're like, oh, what do you want to do? Like, I mean, that was a very clear path. I thought that was going to be the easy one. <laughs> right? right. Like, like she wants to be a teacher. She She's going to be good at it. She, you know, both of my sisters are teachers. And she said, I don't want to do this. And I said, OK, so what do you want to do? And I've always told my kids, like, let's just make a plan. I don't. I don't care what it is, but create a plan. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I had this one path and I I just turned left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now I have no idea. And I mean, she's 20. She's young. She doesn't have to know. And I think, you know, that generational shift, I felt like I had to know because my parents (laughs) knew. Yes. I mean, you know, that it was very specific Mm -hmm. what they did. And like you were saying with the boomers, I mean, they committed. They it didn't matter if they were miserable. They were staying at it that job matter. because they I were ha- they had a pension I know. and they had retirement and they were going to get to like 55 to 60 and then they were going to retire, retire and chill. I that mean, was the plan. They had a plan and mm-hmm. they executed that plan and they did not <laughs> veer off. And anyway, so when I got to college, I failed. So first semester, I was the first person in my family to go to college. I had no went to Baylor, was 17 years old. I wow. was a young graduate and I thought I was going to be a doctor. And I thought it was going to be easy like high school was. High school was totally easy for me. I mean, Uh I loved everything about it. Now my kids are like, this is awful. And I'm like, what? (laughs) I know. I love high school school too. (laughs) So got to college. I had no one to guide me and tell me, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're, you take these placement exams. And so uh, quick, funny story. My senior year in high school, I was in calculus. I've always been good at math. And I was in calculus and my friends were like, why are you taking calculus your senior year? Your senior year is like a blow off. And so I, two weeks in, I went to the school counselor and I said, I'd like to drop calculus. And she's like, well, what are you going to take instead? And I was like, I don't know, a blow off class? Because Mm -hmm. that's what my, I already know I'm going to Baylor. So yeah, does it matter? And I took parenting and I did not want to have kids. Really? Now I have four. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I feel like that's you, another episode that I, we should is, dig into because that's interesting. But my dad was so mad that I dropped calculus 
and took parenting. And, and so I get to Baylor and you have to take this placement exam. And guess what? I placed into calculus and you don't, they don't tell you like you don't have to take what you place into. And so I'm like, okay. And, and at that point I was going to be a doctor. And so I would have to take calculus. Mm -hmm. So first semester at Baylor, don't have anyone to tell me, don't take an 8 a.m. class because you're not going to get up. Oh, no. Don't take biology for pre-med majors, which is a weed out class because everybody thinks they're going to be a doctor. And yeah, so I made a D in calculus. <laughs> I failed my biology class. This is my first what? semester. I have a hard time believing this. I know you as very successful and super intelligent. Isn't that funny? And yeah, it's just hard. For I mean, and but so, if they were at 8 a.m. your first semester in college, you're uh, right. I couldn't get up. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, I dropped what? I dropped college algebra. What? At 8 a.m. on because it was ladies' night on Wednesday night at the club. <laughs> Right. And I could not get there on Thursday yeah. morning. So they sent my parents a letter and said, your student's on academic probation. Back then they sent your parents letters. Now they won't even talk to you. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, as a parent. So, yeah. So it was not a good situation at my household. <laughs> so I dropped pre-med. And then, mm -hmm. so I tried a bunch of different things. I was like, well, I know I want to be in medicine. I know I want to be in the hospital. And so I shadowed a speech pathologist. I but I had to declare a major at some point. Mm -hmm. So my junior year, I declared my major speech pathology. Two weeks, and that's because my dad had a friend who that's what she did, and mm -hmm. so I went and shadowed her, and I was like, yeah, you know, I could do this. It's, I mean, I, but I wasn't excited about it. Yeah, but it was familiar. Yeah. You knew someone who did it. In the hospital, knew someone who did it. Mm -hmm. And two weeks in, I was like, I cannot do this for the rest. Th these classes do not excite me. So I went to my advisor and she's like, we're two weeks in. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and I don't want to be stuck with this major. I don't care what I have to do. And this is my junior year of college. <laughs> anyway, so she, so I go, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And she said, what's your favorite class? I said, psychology. And she goes, major in that. She was like, <laughs> well, I got to get this girl off my back. I yeah. got to figure out. And I was like, hmm, okay. And I said, you know, I like business and I like, I'm good at math. And so I did psychology and business and yeah, and graduated. So what job do you get with that, right? But you can like, apply psychology to anything, anything. right? I mean, it, that's the beautiful the, thing about that right. major. And the business. Because and, people. Well, yeah. <laughs> and they didn't have an HR major back then. Oh, really? Makes you sense. know, or like. I could have gone like marketing, mm -hmm. like the the psychology of marketing and advertising. Mm -hmm. And so so I feel like I, it gave me a pretty good mix. So now I tell any of my friends that are in college, I'm like, just major in your favorite class. <laughs> 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 just get to the when you don't know what you want to do. Yeah. I think that was such a valuable experience for me, because, again, if you're a hard worker mm -hmm. and and can be dependable and trustworthy. The, I willing think you learn and willing to learn. You can go far in yeah. any in any job. And so, yeah, but I just feel like kids right now are under so much pressure and and that maybe well, and we didn't have of it too. the you know, expense of I think it it's, is crazy. It's interesting. So I graduated high school in 2002 and that was everybody's plan was you graduate from high school and you go get a four year degree and then you enter the workforce. That's what we were correct. all taught to do. That's correct. And the problem with that is nobody was also teaching us about personal finance at the same time. So <laughs> right? everybody took out student loans because they were told they had to go get a bachelor's degree at a college. And then where do you want to go to school? Well, in, if you live in Texas, you want to go most likely to the Big 12 school at that time. Right. I don't even know what the conferences are called these days. But the, is it Southwest Conference again? I don't even know. Like, I don't know what they are. But at the time, it was like Texas, or you were going to go to Texas A&M is really popular, or, yep. you know, Southwest, Texas, mm -hmm. San Marcos. Yep. You were just going to go to one of those schools. And at the time, it was twenty to $30,000, you know, a year. Now it's a lot more than that. But 
those loans add up and there's this thing called interest that yep. nobody tells you about when you're 18. I hear you. I and did all those things. I have so many friends, you know, we I'm 40 now. So many friends that are 40, I mean, they're still paying off their student loans. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And it's like another mortgage almost. Yes. And so how do you start life successfully when you've got this albatross around your neck? And I was really fortunate that I didn't have that. Because I went to community college and mm-hmm. ended up doing radio, and I didn't yeah. need a bachelor's degree. Right. Could I have gone and gotten one in radio and communications? Absolutely. But I I was dependable, trustworthy. That's right. Willing That's to right. learn. I showed up, and people taught me what to do. And I was smart enough to look at the people around me that were successful and observe their habits and try to mimic and emulate yeah. them. You know? Like, yeah. it's not that hard, people. Right. Like, Get a job, go to work and figure it out. I know. (laughs) But it just, for people in their 20s right now, it feels hard. It feels heavy and it feels hard. There's the pressure to go do all those things when you could could just go get a job. Like your daughter could just go get a job in an industry that she's curious about. She doesn't have to stay there forever. We, We learned we don't have to do that anymore. Right. So go try it. Yeah. So we're like, you don't, college is not for everyone. You yes. D- you don't, you don't have to go. Don't right. do it because we did it. Because I think they look at us and, and know how much we loved our college experience. Mm-hmm. And then they think that that's what they have to do. And, yeah. and we're like, you know, don't do it for us. Do it for you. Make your, as long as you're happy mm-hmm. and you are fulfilled that's what's important to us and so yeah I had no idea I graduated from college I started working for the American Cancer Society mm-hmm. moved to Austin so it was great yeah single full-time job I always coached gymnastics so I coached in college and then I coached even when I had a full-time job because Austin's expensive to live yes. and when you work for a nonprofit, yeah it doesn't really pay the bills <laughs> so I would coach in the in the afternoon and so then I decided well after I graduated with my undergraduate I okay I don't I've always wanted to be in medicine. I could be a PA. I don't have to be a doctor. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So I moved home and home is here. I moved back to Tyler and I went to the gym here that I grew up in and I was like, I need a job. And my dad (laughs) would remind me, I did not help you get a Baylor degree to coach gymnastics. You don't need a degree. And I'm like, yeah, but it's really fun and I really like it. And so anyway, I so coaching was always just something fun I could do mm-hmm. when I needed to. And you had the skill set. And I had the skill set and, and I really loved it. And so I did that for a while. And then I, I had done an internship. And so I tell all... Everyone who doesn't know what they want to do, I'm like, do an internship Mm -hmm. and see. Mm -hmm. Like, so I did an internship in at the hospital in Waco, and I loved. I just loved being in the hospital, and I had an unfortunate event and broke my leg, and so I was trying to go to classes and do all the PA prerequisites, and I was like, oh my gosh. I, I just, I can't do this right now. And so I actually got a job at, at the hospital here recruiting PAs. Oh. And which is pretty neat. So my dad is very uh, mathematical, and I think that's where I get that analytical math side. And my mom is an artist. I mean, just creative and artsy and I do not have that skill set both of my sisters do Um, I have a sister who was an art teacher in junior high and they do art camps and I mean they're all just both my grandparents were artists and my mom can make anything beautiful and I do not have that skill (laughs) set so I had to like (laughs) but I have a little I I do have those creative entrepreneurial spirit that my mom has Mm -hmm. and so and then my dad's analytical piece and Mm -hmm. so I think being in the business world and so I was like oh hospital administration I can yeah I have a business degree I can do this and it's the business of medicine yeah the business yeah and so I did that for a long time and then a job opened up at the health department and I knew nothing about public health Nothing. And 
the the job title was event planner and I was like well I know how to plan events I can plan a party yeah <laughs> all day and I was like I don't know what this is so I applied I got the job and wasn't looking like I I liked working at the hospital liked recruiting and so I'll never forget so my job was an event planner in public health emergency preparedness. And then the hot topic was pandemic flu. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is years ago. And so so I was supposed to plan educational events all over Northeast Texas around pandemic flu for like commissioner's courts and elected officials so that to help them educate them on what their plans would be. I'm not the subject matter expert on that. I just planned the event and mm-hmm. brought in the subject matter expert. But I'll never forget I was in training and I was in training at Texas A&M and I was in a weapons of mass destruction class. Whoa. Uh-huh. So I'm 27 years old in this class, and I call my mom, and I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Look at this. How, how did I end up here? This is the most bizarre thing. And she's like, yeah, did you tell them that if there's a weapon of mass destruction, you're just going to call your mom? And I, was like, what to do? I was like, hey, 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 you'll be my first phone call, but you don't have to tell everybody. So just really like just a totally different direction. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I I really honed my communication skills and I ended up staying there for 10 years and loved working in public health. I did all their communications, marketing, which is I, how we met, which is how we met <laughs> yeah. forever ago. I brought my kids in to you do did. like PSAs at the yeah, radio station. I think it was hurricane preparedness because we had a we had a couple of years back to back where we had some massive hurricane flooding that we did. traveled this far north, we like did. 2008, nine, maybe. Yeah. Katrina. I. Yes. Uh, Gustav. And I, uh-huh. yeah, all of that, all of that. And I was like, well, I'm really good at this. I think we have to continue to evaluate our strengths. Agreed. Because in that job, I would always say I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. Mm-hmm. And and, you know, later as an executive director, that's what you have to be. <laughs> right. It, it's you have to be a jack of all trades. You need to know what everybody else is yeah. doing and have and some sort so, of. So, but I felt like this loss a little bit in my role at the at the health district because I wasn't a master of anything, mm-hmm. right? Like what? And so then you start questioning yourself, like, what am I really good at? I, I mean. I'm a good talker. (laughs) So it's funny that you said that. I I got asked in a kind of a a learning setting, a big conference setting. It was a leadership setting. We were all asked to write down what our superpower was. And I literally wrote down talking because. Probably what I would say too. (laughs) But but it is. I mean, I've, my mom tells people I came out talking. I'm sure that I did. But it's, it's been my job. I've been paid to talk since I was 18 years old in some form or fashion. And it's like, I, I really don't know what else it is. I mean, I have other skills. I, I, I'm like a jack of all trades too. I know a lot of different things, can do a lot of different things. But when it comes down to what do I probably do best, I'm a pretty good communicator most of the time. And I'll tell you, I hated, and I still don't love them, those exercises where you're supposed to write down what you're good at. Because yes. then I'm like... Maybe I'm not good at anything. Yeah, it's that pressure again, right? I don't I don't know what I'm good at. And so I had the opportunity. This was kind of one of the high points in my career. If you ladies are out there listening, like if you can grab onto something and make that your thing, even if you're not sure if it's your thing. So I knew I was a good communicator and there was an opportunity to be a credentialed communicator in public health and they it was brand new so I was one of 25 people in the country that earned the credential look at you Stephanie and so I thought that that helped fill that void because Mm -hmm. that to me someone else said you are good at this right and so then I could latch on to that strength Mm -hmm. and be like you know what this is my this is what I'm the master of right now and you can play to that strength you can play to that string and you can build on it. Mm-hmm. And 
And so I think, you know, and I've had several of those times where you get to the point where you're like, okay, now I've lost what I'm good at again. <laughs> what am I good <laughs> at again? So and from there I moved to the Alzheimer's Alliance and was their executive director for seven years. And, I, and again, jack of all trades. And I knew that that's what that job entailed. And that was an amazing experience and it's an amazing organization. So, and I transitioned away from that a year ago, but I same thing. I, I had to ask myself, I took a moment because that job requires you to be a jack of all trades. And so then I had to rediscover what is my strength. And I was, I'll never forget, I was sitting in this session uh, with this guest speaker who I went to the session thinking it would be great to bring back to my employees. Yeah. And and she said, write down your strengths. And I was like, Ugh, not this again. <laughs> Great. And I didn't do it. I didn't participate. Because, really? Yeah. And you were over it. I was over it. But then I kept thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Like I would sit at my desk every day and I was like, what am I good at? You know, when I was at the health department, I was a good communicator. And that was my job. Mm -hmm. But now I have to. My job is everything. And so now I feel like I've lost sight of what what is my strength? What am I good at? And so I wrote down a list of what I like best about my job. And, I, and I've conveyed this to other women who have sought me out and said, I, I'm just not sure if I'm happy in my current role. I've had a lot of those conversations with people. And so I sat down because I don't like to look internally. <laughs> My <laughs> husband will tell you that. I don't like to do the exercises. And so I sat down and I reframed it and I was like, what do I like the most about my job? Because that's I reframe. bet that's what I'm good at. And it's also a lot like, what is your favorite class? Yeah, it is. What is your favorite class? And so I realized this is going to come as a shock to everyone. <laughs> my favorite part of my job was budgeting and financial management. I think you also told me when we met you, when you told me you were leaving the Alliance, you told me that that's what the Alliance needed at the time, too. Like, that, you know, different Absolutely. programs go through different um, cycles and phases with their workforce and with their growth. And sometimes you need that skill set. It's what I needed and it's what they needed. Right. And then you get to the end of that cycle and you go, is this what they need still? And, and is this what I need still? That's right. That's right. And yeah. And, and couple that with all the things going on in your personal life. Right? Uh, yeah, because <laughs> that still exists. Because I still have four kids. But, and parents and siblings. Yeah, and, aging parents, all mm -hmm. those things. We have lots of, we have lots of topics we can cover. Yes. In other I would love for you to come back but, and talk about those but, things. And so I sat down and I was like, oh, that's my favorite thing. And they're in the, I've done that for them. I've given that organization the financial stability and that inside and the analysis. And that's how my brain works. And you probably created a framework that somebody else could just come slide into and like just moderate and then yeah. play to whatever their strengths are that the organization needs. But it was a real aha moment for me mm -hmm. uh, that. And, and my husband, I, I've always liked to have control of the bills and I like to have a budget and I like to have a plan. And and so it wasn't an aha moment for him. He's like, yeah, you always want to manage the money. <laughs> and so just so now I do accounting, property management. And my dad used to always tell me when I started in college, that I feel like I've come full circle a little bit. Yes. You should either be an algebra teacher or a CPA. Okay. So I am not a CPA and I'm not an algebra teacher. I did not get the gift of patience. Uh, both of my sisters are teachers, so I guess they did. But I think it's just important to continue to reevaluate. I mean, maybe you're maybe what you're good at at that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's what you can latch on to and hold on to. And now I do accounting all day, every day, most of the time. And I really enjoy it. And it's so... <laughs> 
different and it's fulfilling though for crazy you. and and but I I get to do that and I get to be flexible and available for my family which was important to me I think your priorities shift I agree and so I think us just as women not feeling like we have to be locked into one thing it's okay to take risks and change and I always tell people who seek advice from me like make a what's your favorite class Mm -hmm. what's your favorite thing to do Mm -hmm. make a five-year plan give yourself so if your five-year plan if you want to work for Southwest Airlines give it six to nine months and if that isn't happening then try to redirect that if you want to live you know in Dallas and work for a marketing firm like make that your plan and then after that timeline you can adjust and redirect but don't try to you know fit yourself into a box that you're not happy and fulfilled in I think the the ability to like evaluate and adapt is such an important life skill. I I had to learn it early because I had just kind of an interesting childhood where my parents divorced and they both worked kind of really weird jobs. My dad was on call with the railroad. He was an, a conductor and an engineer for Union Pacific. And then my mom worked 12 hour rotating shifts at Texas Eastman um, making plastic pellets. <laughs> so I was shuffled from different households and babysitters a lot. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn to adapt myself to whatever room I was in to not to survive, but to thrive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't like I was in, I wasn't in terrible situations. My parents took great care of me, but I learned pretty early on that in around different adults, there were different conversations that were happening or there were different lifestyles or different television programs that were watched or whatever, you know, I was observing Mm -hmm. and I would just adjust. Right. And I did the same thing with my teachers in school, so it made me very likable. <laughs> but I but I learned that that's like a life skill that you need when you're communicating with people. You need to be able to meet them where they're at. And mm-hmm. so not that you have to change who you are, but if you can be responsive in a way th- that helps you communicate and helps you both come to a good conclusion or whatever it is or reach a goal, that's a really important skill. It is. And and. I think that I was fortunate Mm -hmm. to be able to have that. I, you know, I think from my childhood and my parents always wanted me to be really independent. Yep. I think the sport of gymnastics made me independent because I had to do things that I had two siblings that they had to take care of. And they would send me off. If this is what you want to do, go to Houston at 10 with no parents. I mean, that's what we did. Yeah. And so it made you really independent mm-hmm. at a young age. And and so you were able to adjust a little bit more. And I think some people didn't get that. And so it's going to be a little bit harder for them to be able to accept that change and take that risk, even though they may really want to. We don't ever have to stop growing and trying something new and I I had a friend once that uh, reached out to me and and we're really close and and she was considering this job and I was like if you want my advice I would say don't do it you know it was the benefits package it was the salary that came with it and she did it and and because I, I had a totally different perspective. I'm 10 years older than her, and I'm like, money's not worth it. But 10 years ago, I wouldn't have said the same thing because I'm, I've got little toddlers at home running around. I, like, I've got mouths to feed. I didn't have the same perspective she did. She did it. She hated it. She moved on. But then would she have moved on if she didn't have that experience? And so I think, you know, I'm a firm believer in everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And you don't know unless you try. Mm -hmm. Apply for the job, even if it's a long shot, because if you don't, then you'll never know. Yeah, right? I, think, I, I think somebody gave me really good advice once, which is similar. It's take the interview. 
you Take know, if, the if somebody's recruiting you, I got recruited several years ago when I left Town Square Media. KLTV was looking for someone to be their web anchor. Mm-hmm. The person was leaving the job. She was going into a sales position and they were like, you'd be a natural fit for this. We think you have the skill set. And I was incredibly flattered because I've never been on camera at this point. And just, it's just not something I ever really aspired to do. I liked being able to wander around with no makeup and pajamas and not be recognizable because... Nobody <laughs> really recognizes your voice. Right. They recognize your face more, right? And so I, I didn't think it was what I wanted to do. I was transitioning full time into network marketing with Zingular. And I really wanted to explore that and see what happened. And I was I was committed to taking that risk. And so I interviewed and I just told him, I said, look, I think I need to pursue this other path. I don't think this is the right fit. And he said, well, why don't you come in today? I said, because somebody gave me the advice to always take the interview. And I really did. I'm genuinely very flattered that you wanted to offer me this opportunity mm-hmm. and I wanted to explore it. Who knows? I might have said yes. I got in here and I realized, no, I think I need to follow the path mm-hmm. I was committed to. But one day this might come around and be something I explore. And sure enough, how many years later, seven years later, I'm now freelancing with CBS right. 19 as their lifestyle host. Did not know that was a skill set that I really had. They KLTV saw it in me years ago. It wasn't the right time. But then this came along and they didn't want to hire me full time and stick me somewhere for eight hours, which is what KLTV wanted to do. They said, can we work around your schedule? Can you come in for 30 minutes to an hour at a time and do this freelance with us? And I was like, yes, I can. I think I can do that. Let's see if it works. If it fail, I won't do it again. Yeah. But it was a natural fit. But you don't want to sit there and say, what if I had have gone to that interview? Exactly. So yeah. I I am a firm believer in, like you said, take the interview, mm-hmm. explore something new, learn mm-hmm. something new, be be a lifelong learner because you never know where that road is going to take you. The Celebrating Women Podcast wants to hear from you. Email us a voice message to Celebrating Women Podcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear your story or the story of an incredible woman you know. Become part of the conversation on social media. Facebook.com slash Celebrating Women Podcast. On Instagram, search Celebrating Women Podcast. The Celebrating Women Podcast has been presented by Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler, Texas. Book your appointment today. Stop by the spa in Cumberland Shopping Center or online at handandstonetyler.com. Support the show for as little as $3 per month at Celebrating Women Podcast buzzsprout.com or visit our show notes. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe to the Celebrating Women podcast. Hey guys, it's Mandy. Have you been struggling to lose those extra pounds? I know I have totally been there. An extra, you know, 15 to 20 pounds can totally creep up on you in perimenopause, or at least it has with me. And I think I found it early. I hope it's not happening to you. But if it is, I've got the solution. You can lose up to 15 pounds in eight days with an incredible product line that I found and I want to share with you. Get a custom product recommendation with a complimentary wellness screening in the show notes. Just click Zing with Mandy.